welcome everyone to Almost Cancelled. I'm Peter, and today I'm going to be talking about Debris, Season 1, Episode 4. It's called In Universe, so full spoilers for the episode as always. And this was an interesting episode, I thought. I There's definitely some rough edges, there's definitely a couple of things that uh, felt like a, maybe a rushed delivery or a, a rushed idea, but ultimately the character dynamics and the uh, the overall message that the episode's playing with, uh, I, I quite enjoyed. Um, I think what this episode made me realize, well, in, and it's not that I didn't notice this before, but I was especially, I'd seen that they've now consistently done this for a few episodes, is that I'm really starting to dig just the visuals of this show. Obviously, sometimes when it's just them in the car or in a truck or in a room discussing what's going on, it's just, you know, it looks like a TV show. But, there's a distinct visual quality to certain moments, and it was particularly when they were walking out in this episode, and they've got essentially, uh, you know, the, 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 later on one of them calls it calls them space suits, and they're not really astronaut suits, but they're very close to astronaut suits. Uh, they serve a lot of the same purpose, and it's you know walking out into the field and it, just the, 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 the discoloring because the atmosphere of this zone has changed. In fact, the fact that they keep calling it the zone was making me think of Annihilation and by proxy Stalker, which is kind of what Annihilation was largely inspired by. Um, so again, the premise I thought was super interesting this episode. A piece of debris lands in a small uh, farming town, and it literally changes the atmosphere. It starts to terraform a small section of, uh, you know, this town or the whole town, but not nothing beyond, at least yet. Uh, and we sort of witness the characters that we meet at the start of the episode start to cough and struggle, but they seem to be okay after like a minute. They seem to be fine, except for the fact that the rain has a slight discoloring to it. Like there's just a little bit of a colouring in the in the water. And we see one character sort of wander outside of the area and drop dead and die. And it's sl slowly revealed over the course of the episode exactly what killed him. Uh, but it turns out, of course, that it wasn't the rain that killed him, it was leaving the rain that killed him. The idea being that this terraforming is actually changing the people who were inside it to adapt to this new atmosphere that it's building, meaning that they are no longer able to breathe in Earth's normal atmosphere, which is an interesting premise in and of itself. But, uh, a super. I mean, the first thing I thought of was last week's episode. They talked about how the part of the ship, the part of the debris that was, you know, letting us see this door to this other dimension. It was, you know, navigation tech. It was, it was the part of the ship that navigates into this other dimension. So immediately, as soon as they started talking about this terraforming, I just started thinking, oh, well, this is life support. This is the life support part of the ship that let these aliens, you know, breathe in presumably their own atmosphere. That They need more chlorine in the atmosphere is one of the things they mentioned in this episode. So I thought that was super intriguing. I I was so into the visuals of this, the visuals of walking around in these cornfields and the spacesuits, um, mix in the music, which what if I, I I probably mentioned this or made this comparison, but I was really getting the Vangelis from Blade Runner or Vangelis. I'm not sure you pronounce the, the the group who did the uh, uh the Blade Runner score, but. Like, I was getting, there was particularly a big scene right towards the end of the episode when the people are frozen uh, using the other debris, which, again, even just the idea that there's other pieces of debris that have got things. And again, if we're going back to what part of the ship or what purpose did this technology have on the ship, well, I mean, how many shows or movies do we do we talk about that have cryosleep for, for humans on a spaceship? Is it possible that this stasis technology that they, they're accessing from this other piece of debris from a separate case that didn't happen on the show, is it possible that that's what that's for on the spaceship? Like, so far, you're able to, to kind of say this is what the purpose of these things are for the most part. Maybe if I go back to like episode 1 and 2, it'll be more difficult. Um, episode 2 is maybe was more about keeping the ship together, or it was like, you know, keeping the, the gravity of the ship together or something, I don't know. Episode one's a bit harder, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you could probably sit and theorize, but I like that this episode and last episode, there's three pieces of debris where we can kind of say, oh, that was the purpose of this technology on the ship. At least the best guess that we have. Uh, so I like that. Uh, I like that. It, it, it makes it all feel like it's not just random things happening. Um, and, you know, so far the, the episode by episode premises have been very strong, I think. 
Um, you know, obviously one of the things we've been talking about throughout this show is uh, it's a bit little, maybe too saccharine for some people. And I've not really had a problem with that so far. I do think this episode does overstep just a touch. And I do mean just a touch because I actually love the, the moral quandary of this episode, which is that Finola is set up as the one with the heart and that Brian's the one who has trouble acknowledging and dealing with his emotional side and therefore he is very good at just being kind of the military man, being the very cold, calculated, uh, and the idea that Finola might slowly change that in him over time. And we hear that he used to have a partner named Jules who is dead now and part of the reason why Jules might be dead is because he had a heart. People used to say that about him, that he had heart. Uh, so he's warned by this by some old, you know, some old uh, colleague who comes into the site. But we're set up with that, and I like that. I like this because, you know, we've been talking about him struggling with his emotions uh, and how it's been kind of you know, neatly set up throughout the episodes in various ways. Even when it's not completely in your face like it was in, say, episode one and two, there was something more subtle last episode. Uh, this episode obviously brings it back to the forefront, uh, although from a different angle, the angle of comparing them and the angle of kind of, you know, this, this dispute, which ultimately becomes, there's a family inside the the zone who uh, their, their, you know, uncle character arrives outside, he's not allowed inside, uh, Ephraim's his name, uh, and he, he doesn't, he, he doesn't get to obviously get told all the facts, right? But Finola ultimately wants to tell him, especially when they get to the conundrum, that this this terraforming event is going to start to expand. It's starting to get bigger. So they have to effectively contain the debris that's causing it to stop, you know, because potential. I mean, the entire planet might get terraformed. It's entirely possible. So they have to stop it. But the problem is, is that if they remove the debris and therefore remove this pocket of atmosphere, what happens to the people who have changed? What happens to them? What happens to the little boy that that is part of the family that that Brian finds at one point? And again, a very pretty scene. Uh, I think when the, it gets very atmospheric, when it gets ethereal and the music kicks in, I'm usually into what it's doing. Um, it's got that sort of that wonder, but not not a. It can be beautiful at times. It, it definitely can be. It can be. Um, but definitely kind of a ethereal wonder, something that can also be dangerous. Uh, it, it gets that sort of vibe really well, which is it's, it's basically the sort of vibe that you want from anything about Gennetti Space, which obviously this isn't Gennetti Space, but uh, a lot of those same feelings just kind of, you know, it's like the, the humbling of how like crazy things are that we don't understand yet, that we're, we haven't yet figured out. So anyway, um... That's the conundrum, and Finola wants to tell him everything. She wants to tell this, this, you know, this guest star, uh, and this is where I think the episode fails a little bit because I don't think they actually tell us why she shouldn't. Effectively, uh, Brian says you can't do that. Brian, you know, like we're supposed to be blips in these people's lives, not memories, um, and you have to be cold. You have to be calculated. And because there's a scene that that, that separate there's a separate scene before this when they first hear about the the the, the zone expanding, and Brian's like, okay, we're going to have to like contain this and like remove the debris. And Finola immediately says, no, but the people inside they're going to die. And Brian does make a good point in this scene. He says, well, yeah, but if it keeps expanding, then what about the people in the rest of the you know the nearby cities? What about the people in the state and then um, potentially the entire planet? Like we kind of have to worry about who we can save rather than who we can. But when we get to this scene later, and she's come up with this this you know idea to use another piece of debris, they can put them into stasis. Uh, they won't even age or anything. They'll just be in stasis, and they don't have the science yet to revert them or sort of reverse the mutation that's happened because of the terraforming. But one day we'll have that. It might be years. It might even be decades. There's a scene where Finola talks to another scientist lady and she's like, no, this might be decades away before we even can possibly scratch this. And, but it's one of those things where Brian says, you don't know if this will work. And she says, effectively she says, but does it matter? Because that's what I was thinking. Well, does it matter if it would work? It's either they're definitely going to die or they might not die. And that's essentially what the point she makes is the alternative to certain death is giving them a chance what is the downside to trying this? Um, 
and she's already kind of approved it. Maddox has already approved uh, this to come in, which is funny that she went to Maddox, which is, you know, the CIA guy, uh, like, you know, over over his head. But yeah, I didn't really get, like, his argument didn't really, well, have an argument, really. He didn't really have much of a counterpoint. She just kind of went over his head, which is fine as a, as a moment in and of itself, because that's kind of a beat, the idea that he feels, I don't know, a little betrayed or a little undermined, because she just kind of went and done it without him. Um, maybe that ties into the whole he should be, you know, careful, not get too attached to his partner, because, you know, this kind of thing might start happening. But then she says she's going to tell Ephraim everything. She's going to go and tell him. And this was the line that really annoyed me in this this scene, in this episode, is that when he says, why are you going to tell him? And she sort of takes a pause and then says, because people believe, deserve to know the truth about the people they love. It was very on the nose. It was very specific to the fact that he knows something about her father and he's not told her. Um, it was just a little too beating me over the head with the, the dramatic irony. I feel like you can conjure up the comparison to that plot line without you know really going that far with it with, without really spelling it out to me uh so it, i don't want to say my in, my intelligence was insulted per se but it's definitely a case of like being a bit too network tv and being a bit too specific um but that, that was that's the that's the part that i really didn't get though in terms of like the argument is that he says uh oh, you know it's supposed to be a blip not a memory um, he shouldn't know any of this, but he never actually gives a compelling reason as to why he shouldn't be told. Uh, it, like it just cuts to her going in and lying to him and saying, "Oh, and being like the cold kind of authority style character, like, oh, we're going to have to detain you and test you, but we can't tell you anything at this time." You know, very, very stoic. And if Coley eats at her, but he, you know, she walks out and Brian's like, "You're doing the right thing," and I'm like, "Why?" <laughs> why is it the right thing tell me explain it to me <laughs> is it just because the, the tech that they have from the the debris is like classified so they're not allowed to tell anyone if it's just that then okay like just say that <laughs> just say but i just it never really says that he just it, it, it came off as a little undercooked to me because i never understood exactly why she shouldn't tell him um especially since like because if that's all it was, if it was just a case of, oh, he's not supposed to know what this tech can do because it's all top secret, no one's meant to know anything, uh, fine, that's breaking the rules. And it's the sort of thing we would go, okay, it's kind of shitty in this case because he should know, but ultimately there's a reason for the rule being there. And we understand, not that it's that unbelievable that authorities and, and organizations have dumb uh, rules that are just, you know, nothing <laughs> there just there's nothing for them they just exist because people feel good with rules to follow um but reg regardless um she has a motivator because i think the motivator for why she does ultimately tell him is quite good she she gets a call from her superior uh, and we spend so much time with maddox side of things that her side of like the the the, the mi6 lady like her stuff is uh not been as much but Basically, it shows that they're somewhat competent because they have also discovered that her father is alive. And she tells her, tells Finola, she tell, shows her pictures of him to convince her. Uh, but the important thing here is that she says that there's no way the Americans didn't know about this. There's no way that the CIA did not know about this. So your partner probably knows or, you know, whatever the line was. And that's the important dramatic beat of the episode. And I do like this. I like that she finds out separate and that, they, that she knows he knows but he doesn't know she knows. <laughs> he doesn't know that she knows that he knows. You know what I'm saying? So there they both have this kind of unspoken thing that should be out in the open now, but isn't. And I think that's far more interesting than it coming out in a big dramatic moment and having her reaction. I, I think giving her time to stew on it a little bit is going to pay dividends when it actually does eventually come out in the open. Um... Because I think it's notable that this episode starts with like a, uh, a fun character beat for Brian. I sort of like a, both for her and for the audience to like him a bit more, it starts with a silly scene of him getting the Elvis sunglasses. Uh, and, you know, he gets the slushy in the Elvis sunglasses, but he forgot to get her water, which is, you know, a bit childish, but in a kind of nice enough way and amusing. Uh, but then 
and then later in the episode, when he's taking blood from the the, the kid who's kind of scared, he gives him the Elvis sunglasses to make him feel uh, confident, you know, to give him some uh, some motivation and make him feel like a king. And it's a it's kind of a sweet little scene. And again, it's this thing where Brian ain't all bad. Bri- Brian has clearly some notable qualities. He's not very in tune with these emotions. And maybe he does have to learn some stuff from Fanola, uh, and vice versa, perhaps as well. Uh, you know, Fanola can't necessarily just fly off the handle based on you know her heart constantly. Uh, there has to be a little bit of uh, you know regulation, self-regulation uh, specifically. But uh, yeah, so so the, so the, the drama that's set up here and how they're they're using the the things that they've already established. Um, for the two main characters, I think are, are solid, but I do think the line about knowing the truth about the people you love is forced, and I do think the debate of why she should or shouldn't tell Ephraim uh, could have been like better defined, and I, just to understand why she was being told she shouldn't tell him. And then, the Ephraim, because I actually think the scene of Ephraim, because after this, when she realizes that Brian's been lying to her, and she's found out her dad's alive. She goes to him and then, you know, goes back and everything she's lied about and tells him the truth, says they're going to be frozen, essentially, in stasis because of this technology. And, you know, I would want to know to make my choice. And I actually really like the scene of him running towards his family. Like, he makes the choice to run into the zone. He has changed. He coughs like everyone at the start of the episode did. He gets to them and he makes the choice to be frozen with them. Because he would rather go into stasis with them and be with them when they're all woken up, potentially, which could be beyond his lifetime. Uh, and even if it isn't beyond his lifetime, what, is he going to be like 60 when they, they're finally unfrozen? And his nephew, instead of being someone he can still run around with, he can barely, you know, wheel around with? I, I don't know. Like, the, the point I'm making is that th- th- this is a very logical choice. If he, if he doesn't have anyone else on the outside, if his entire family, if everyone he cares about is in that bubble, in that zone then of course, why wouldn't he want to be frozen with them so he can still be with them later on uh, and go on that journey? Um, in fact, honestly, he does have some issues as a character, not in concept, just kind of in dialogue. That uh, When I mentioned earlier that I thought part of the, the saccharine kind of the human plot, which I do like the, the human side to everything that's here, uh, typically as a theme, but th- there is one scene with him when he's the, the emotional side comes out when he starts talking about how he thinks he's being punished by God. And it was just a really maybe overwritten scene because I think the actual key points that he needs to make in that scene are fine. Like, the points being that, you know, his brother died and he essentially, you know, promised that he would take care of his brother's family because his brother had, like, four kids and his, and a wife, of course. And he initially, when he was younger, thought his brother was stupid for, you know, starting a family young and but he's since come to find comfort in them but even with that comfort he still like finds you know he still feels the burden of having them around like, it's not just an, a completely happy thing there's a there's a push and a pull to it and you know he likes being able to get away because his job's on the road for a bit and then come back but uh ultimately he, you know he makes this choice to be with them uh at the end of the episode. I, I think the the core beats of what the character does in this episode, I think the actual scene of him running to the to the family towards the end and, you know, going through the zone and at the field, seeing them again, being frozen with them, I think all those scenes are good. It's just that speech he makes uh, is a bit iffy, I think. Yeah, maybe a bit too dramatic too quickly would be my... I, I, would, have start, I would have started a bit, you know, subtler, I guess, <laughs> rather than I'm being punished by God for having thoughts of not wanting my family <laughs> that was just maybe a bit of a stretch or a bit too extreme for my taste but everything else after that i was kind of fine with the, the only critiques really from my guest star point of view is that some of the uh there's a couple of people who are inside the zone uh that are maybe not great actors you know there's one guy with a beard who he he doesn't have a lot of lines but he has a few lines when they first find them uh, and he, he came across to me as a pretty weak actor uh, there's also some coincidental stuff here, you know, the, the one guy in the outside uh, happens to be related to the the one woman inside who lost the, their son who's running around, so, like, all the prominent characters from the town end up being all part of the same family, so there's a little bit of a coincidental uh, side to things. It's not, I mean, it's not the biggest contrivance ever, but it was just, it was sort of thing where when he was outside and he was asking to get in to see his family, 
and he showed a photo of his family and it's the you know it's the, it's the people that Fanola already spoke to when she was inside the spacesuit i was kind of like ah, oh, okay, of course it is <laughs> like you know it made me roll my eyes a little bit uh but it's not a huge thing really problem wise um so yeah a couple of critiques but i you know i, I dug all that stuff um and ultimately all of this with Fanola and brian comes down to the ending where you know, I, again, I love the music of all this happening, of the, the atmosphere changing once they took the debris away, but Brian goes in in the space suit and he sees them all sort of in stasis, all these people standing there just completely still with this sort of, like, force field around them. And they are still alive, so it has worked. Uh, they, they are still functioning. And he sees, you know, he sees this guy who's, who was meant to be in the outside, he sees Ephraim, and... He sort of almost smiles, but kind of moves on. It's kind of more of a reaction, I guess. Um, but when he gets outside and he, he runs into Finola, he he asks like, "Hey, you know, why did you do it?" And she's basically like, "You won't understand." And he's like, "No, I want to. I want you. I want to understand." And I, I do kind of believe him. I, I think that's kind of one of the one of the the central themes we're playing here with these two characters is that I do genuinely think he does want to understand her way of thinking like her viewpoint her empathy uh, i think he is is he's not really a complex character yet i don't want to give the show too much credit but i think at least the potential for the character is the idea that he's a, he's someone and i may be thinking a little bit of amos from the expanse where he knows he's a little uh cold or a little unbalanced when it comes to to morals and ethics and he almost wants to connect to someone who can like teach him to be better he, he wants to sort of find that uh maybe it's you know because of things that have happened in his life because of stuff that's happened recently maybe it's losing this partner maybe it's whatever but it's it's this whole idea of a second chance to grow and be someone better and i i do wonder like you know it's obviously she gives him the cold shoulder here at the end and gets a ride back to the plane to start paperwork she doesn't want to be around him so their their relationship is clearly going to be strained next episode. So I'll be very interested to see how they keep playing with that. Uh, but so while I do have some nitpicks about some of the scenes and some of the dialogue uh, along the way, I do overall like the gist of what they're doing with the pair. Um, so cool. Uh, there is a scene uh, with Maddox, and we you know we were interested in the idea of his of his son last episode, and we see him with his son uh, this episode and. This is maybe a, a a little scene to humanize him a little bit. Uh, you know, he's 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 being, you know, the best dad he can be in the in the circumstance, and he's, uh, he's trying to throw a ball to his son who clearly can't be, he's you know can't catch a ball. This is kind of the scene, but he keeps doing it and sort of motivating him and hyping him up anyway. Um, but uh, the the key thing in the scene, other than him just sort of like putting on this hat and uh, trying to hang out with his son. Is that uh, the the phone keeps ringing? Like uh, there's a phone in the table, uh, and at first you don't necessarily realize that it's not his. It's not until later where you realize it's his wife's phone. But it's an unknown caller. He answers it, and whoever's there just kind of hangs up. Uh, and the wife catches him just at the end of this and says, "Wait, why are you answering my phone?" And she's like, "Hey, not everyone's a conspiracy," and sort of you know takes it out of his hand. And he just kind of th- sort of shrugs it off. Now, obviously, like the typical implication here is that maybe she's cheating on him or something, or whatever. Uh, I mean, I'm not necessarily thrilled at that. I don't really care about that. Uh, it's a scene for Maddox, though, just to sort of like sort of cement what we kind of learned last week about him. Uh, it's fine, you know. It's just one scene; it doesn't really take away from the rest of the episode all that much. But uh, it is there, so good. Um, yes, I'm f- I'm further uh further convinced that uh. Or I'm not convinced. That's that's not the wrong word. I'm just I'm I'm just thinking here as I'm saying. Uh, I'm I'm further speculating. You know whether or not influx are good guys or bad guys. I'm not really sure yet. A part a part of me wonders there because I think the reason why I was thinking about that is because uh, MI6 lady said that your father appears to be kidnapped by influx, and all I could think was, is it kidnapped? <laughs> and I think you know I think we I, th- I, sp- I spoke in previous episodes about maybe him being the leader or something. But I, I wonder if there's more of a noble cause to them than maybe we're we're getting right now. Uh, but you know, curious. Um, yeah, actually, well, one thing before we I wrap up this discussion, there was a comment on the last episode review that was. It, it felt very odd to read, and then I checked, and then kind of got what they were saying. But it was it was a comment about uh, how 
Maddox was one of the influx people at the scene that teleported away, uh, you know, in the forest when they almost ran into, you know, the agents last episode. And the other comment said, why is no one talking about this? And I was like, because I don't think he was there. And I went, I went back and I looked at the episode and I looked at Maddox in one scene. I looked at this guy in the, the forest who teleported away in the other scene um, and there's definitely a resemblance, I, and it's funny because I was like, I don't actually think it actually is the same person. There, there, there's a very similar rese- the face, don't get me wrong, similar beard, similar hair. Um, if it is him, then I'm just going to say that the fact that he wasn't wearing glasses in the, tre- the, the forest scene means that Superman could happen, and the Clark Kent disguise is not stupid. But... Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I was, it was one of those things where I was looking at the, the, the photos, I was looking at the, the, the screenshots back and forth, where I was almost like talking myself into it being the same person. But then I, I sort of looked and I was like, nah. I sort of didn't look for a while. Then I looked back again. I was like, nah. I don't think it is. Um, I think there's just enough differences in the beard, uh, and a couple of little details. But they're very similar looking. If, if, if there's no connection between the random guy, and I think the reason why it never even occurred that it was revealing something like that is because the episode never dwelled on it. The, the scene didn't play it like a moment. Like, dun, 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 Maddox is there. Um, if it is him, then fair enough. Like, it totally could be. <laughs> like, he looks similar enough that it could be him. But if it isn't him and there's no connection to the character... Other, you know, otherwise, like, uh, uh, if, he, if he's not, like, Maddox from the future, if he's not, like, an alternate universe version of Maddox, or whatever wacky shenanigans they could do, if he's not him, now that it's been pointed out to me that this guy looks so much like him, uh, it's kind of a weird casting choice to cast someone who looks so similar to another character uh, that you've already cast, so that's a bit weird, if that's the case. Uh, but feel free, feel free to uh, <laughs> go back and compare yourself. <laughs> There's, like, one good shot of him, uh, when they're hiding behind the trees uh, last week's episode and then look at Maddox in any other scene and just, you know very similar looking I don't think it's the same guy my, my, my official stance right now is that it's not him but uh, I get why I get why someone thought it was but I reserve the right to not look a complete fool if it does turn out to be him because I acknowledge there's a strong resemblance okay that is uh that has been me. So hopefully you've had fun with my rambles on episode four of Debris. Uh, solid, flawed, but solid episode. And there was an interview with uh, Jonathan Tucker. I didn't read the whole thing, but uh, one of the things that was said is that the first five episodes are kind of like a primer, uh, and then this sort of story starts to really unfold. So I wonder if that means we're going more serialized, like soon, like in episode six onwards. That'd be very fascinating to see them sort of almost do that thing that Fringe took a lot more time to do. Fringe was, you know, was a case of the week show for like a season and a half before it went truly serialized. Uh, so it'd be kind of interesting to see this just sort of do it this early on in season one. But there is a lot of spinning plates happening. There's a lot of progression that it could sort of delve into. Um, but hey, and I'm enjoying the show. Uh, I'm liking it more pretty much each week as I'm getting more familiar, growing more attached. Uh, so please, NBC, don't cancel it. Or let Peacock uh, save it. Move it to Peacock if that's what it's going to take. They can give us a few 10 episode seasons to get a full story out of it. That'd be lovely. Wouldn't it? That'd be lovely. All right. Thank you very much for joining me. Please do like and subscribe. Liking is super important on YouTube and it helps us be reached to more people. Uh, that was a horrible sentence, but you know what I mean. The algorithm, the YouTube algorithm loves those likes and comments and subscriptions, so please do all those things. They're all free and uh, help us out immensely. If you want to go on a little step further, though, if you want to give us a little bit of the monies, you can do that over at patreon.com slash TV and get some bonuses and help keep all the content coming. But uh, otherwise, that is me. So thank you once again for watching or listening. I always appreciate it. Keep watching TV. Have you got any vanilla?